uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to this kind of uh, Hartrifoca members open spring open seminar sessions, uh, which is a kind of uh, yeah series of uh, seminars uh, that uh, uh, our group uh, is organized for this uh, next Mondays in this spring season, uh, continuing uh, with our activities under con strict confinement. Uh, we thought that uh, since uh, we have uh, started having a community of uh, researchers uh, around the world that uh, in the past were working in our group, either as postdocs or as PhD students. So it was uh, very easy uh, to ask them to visit us and uh, give us a talk about uh, the uh, actual topics of uh, research. Mm -hmm. My idea was uh, to organize this uh, in a regular uh, in a regular form and uh, physically there uh, at the ICQ, ICAQ, but I hope to start uh, the normal activities maybe very, very, very soon, I think in autumn. Our life will be almost fully or re uh, actualized, uh, renormalized, say. Yeah? Uh, so today we have uh, uh, Nuno Bandeira. Uh, Nuno is uh, actually a researcher at the Biosystems and Integrative Science Institute of the Faculty of Science of the University of Lisbon in Portugal. Uh, Nuno, Nuno spent uh, several years in our lab, uh, first as postdoctoral researcher in the framework of the past Severo Ochoa program. And then he won uh, the actual position he has is a three year research program. Uh, that uh, actually he spent one year in with us and, uh, and now he's uh, building his own research group. Yeah. And uh, so I'm very happy and very pleased uh, that uh, Nuno was the first in accepting this invitation and that actually was uh, organized in a quite short time, very few weeks ago we had the idea and we have the series organized and uh, we are happy and we have been uh, uh, meeting the group uh, the, last, the last past hour and now it's time to, to listen uh, the recent results uh, that Nuno got and that are very interesting regarding electron transfer. Uh, so pure quantum mechanics today in this first talk. Yeah. So Nuno, the screen is yours. Yes. Nuno. No, no. Me? Can you hear me? Now, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I was afraid my connection could be a little bit uh, unstable. How about now? No better. But a bit unstable, yes. So, can I start now? Mm, yes. Now, yes. Oh, go on. Can I begin? See? Si. Yes, please. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, I was... Uh, okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Can everyone see what uh, what I'm looking at? Yes, perfect. Okay. So uh, this is a, a little something that was um, that uh, our group had been working on um, for quite a while now, and. I'm a little embarrassed to uh, uh, 
to put this timeline here, but it, it just, uh, I just thought it was funny to, to at least give you a, a, an overview of how, of how old this project really is. So uh, there was a postdoc uh, uh, called Hui Tsang Liu. Uh, he, uh, he worked with my, uh, my PhD supervisor in, in 2001. And when he left, uh, he, um, he left behind a report with um, uh, the synthesis and some of the properties pertaining to a mixed metal polyoxymetallate. So I'll be expanding on that a, a little bit later. So the time is that I, in 2002, uh, I went for an internship uh, and that's how I uh, got to meet Maria Jose Callarda and, and joined her group. And eventually I uh, took a PhD there. So, and in 2011, uh, Hui Tsang leaves academia and he sets up his own company uh, for molecular sieves, uh, manufacturing molecular sieves. And he's now very, very rich because the Chinese have realized that um, their, their industry is polluting. So uh, the only way to, uh, to get rid of uh, toxic industrial weight is, uh, waste is to um, manufacture molecular sieves. And these molecular sieves um, um, are used for uh, detoxification of, of industrial waste. So in 2012, um, this is when I, uh, let me see if I can use this. Okay. Can everyone see the pointer? Okay. So 2012, that's when I get to know about this, uh, this little project and Maria Jose asked me if, if I could possibly add some calculations to it because the project was a little bit uh, incomplete um, owing to the fact that there is no crystal structure um, of this uh, polyoxymetallate. And of course, in 2013, that's when I joined the group of Carlos. And in 2016, that's when I come back to Lisbon. In 2019, Maria Jose Cajardo retires. So uh, she's been dedicating herself now to uh, getting stuff out of the drawer and uh, getting it published. And uh, last year, um, she asked me if I was able to, you know, come back to this project and see what what I you know how much I progressed and and if we could add something to it and rewrite something and uh, a good excuse was this special issue of the journal of chemical physics uh, to honor women in chemistry so obviously since we now have a deadline we you know we can move things forward and and try to get something published so and uh, of course, we were lucky enough to get the paper accepted. So this is uh, a, sh uh, a little triumph. So uh, this periodic table in Catalan is something that I copied from um, Dolores's slides. Dolores, Dolores Melgar, who is also is also a PhD student with with Carlos. And I I think you all know about polyoxymetallates, um, presumably, but just, just so you know that I'm going to be talking about the classic uh, or the quintessential polyoxymetallate architecture, which is the Kegin structure uh, modified with uh, tungsten and molybdenum. Okay. So one of the primary goals of, of the project uh, at the time, photochemistry was very fashionable. So the idea was to somehow modify the classic Kegin structure to generate a lacuna uh, on, um, on the Kagan structure and modify it. Okay, so uh, this has some parallels with surface chemistry. So you're, you're, in a sense, you're generating vacancies, right? So um, if you generate a vacancy here, you can then refill it with whatever you want. In this case, we were thinking about molybdenum or molybdate moieties uh, because they have slightly different uh, properties or slightly different uh, chemical features from uh, tungsten itself. So the idea was to add two molybdenum atoms or rather 
as 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 few molybdenum atoms as possible and try to somehow confine electrons there because when you reduce a polyoxymetallate and you add electrons to it, the electrons are delocalized over the entire structure. So the goal was to somehow uh, localize or pinpoint electrons in a specific region of this molecule and see what kind of properties you get from that. So just a little intro on isomerism and uh, what kind of structures you can get from, from the classic Kagan structure. So in nomenclature, you can say that uh, the most stable isomer is the alpha one. And you get this blue shaded trimer here because it has special relevance to it. Because if, if you rotate this trimer here, by 60 degrees, you get you get the beta isomer, uh, which is this one here, okay? But now you can have different options. So within the alpha family, you can either generate a lacuna by removing uh, three octahedra from different positions in, in this structure here. So for each of this trimer, one octahedra goes away or you can just remove a, 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 a whole triad and you get a different type of structure and likewise for the beta family, okay? So in this case, uh, we can modify it and we can end up with say uh, four options, uh, four possible uh, options in, in this case. But there, there aren't as many as, as you see here. It's just to see, uh, you know, for, so you can um, see the, the, the general specificity of, 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 the, um, of, the, of the isomer families that you can get from, from this, um, from this, pot, from this uh, structure here. So if you add two, two molybdate moieties over in this structure, so this is a synthetic procedure that was followed in, um, in 1977 by Massau. So they start with a B beta type uh, lacunary structure. This is commercially available and it's stable. And you add two molybdate moieties, uh, in aqueous solution. You end up with this structure right here, but the beta isomer is unstable. So it quickly rearranges and turns back to a B alpha type isomer. And this is the composition of the structure that Hui Tsang Liu obtained. Okay, so it has three protons, two molybdenum atoms, and this generic composition right here. And Hui Tsang isolated the structure and then he tritated, uh, he, he, he did a, a redox titration on this structure to uh, produce a single, uh, singly reduced polyoxymetallate of this type right here. And there was also an added proton. So you can say it was just, you know, you added one hydrogen atom over to this structure. And then we ended up with a structure of this, uh, this type right here. Okay. So this is the, um, the summary of Hui Tsang's final report. So it, pres it, it presented a, a, an extensive uh, characterization and analysis of, uh, of these compounds, both the oxidized and the reduced structure. And my task was to come up with uh, an ideal chemical structure of, um, of these uh, final um, obtained uh, structures right here. So, okay, so the, the, um, there was no crystal structure available. So uh, the, either the crystals didn't diffract or, uh, or it was just a powder. So uh, I was left with coming up with uh, uh, an easily, or to come up with um, decent chemical structures or um, something that provided a, a structural insight into what was, um, occurring here and also to describe what happens when you reduce 
these polyoxymethylate species. And we know that the electron is going to reside in molybdenum because the redox potential is slightly higher than tungsten. So what happens there? So my first goal was to first somehow map out the possibilities that you could have for the, the entirely oxidized structure. And we know that it only has three protons. And my assumption here was the protons should reside mostly in the, uh, in the lacuna. And this was my basic assumption. And, uh, and I think it's a reasonable one. Also, um, I also mm, made some, uh, I mean, th this is just a summary of, of, of the possibilities that I, that I tried. Um, these are the most obvious isomers. You can think of slightly different isomers, but um, if, if there's three protons, you have to think of where to put them. And I think, you know, uh, there are a myriad of possibilities in, in, in regards to these structures, but I think a chemically reasonable possibility is, you know, summarized in, in these isomers right here. And I think um, if you look at this, this here, this structure right here, you can see that why the beta isomer is not as stable as the alpha one. So here you've got two isomers that are leading. So 1D and 1A. And uh, these are the um, thermal distributions of each of them with regards to um, the proton population. And of course, we're going to focus on, on this row right here. And these are the structures that correspond to each of the isomers. Okay, so you can see the protons. This is the lacuna. And these are the, the proton sites and where they are located. Okay. So this is just a, so, a short sketch, uh, a chem draw sketch of where uh, uh, of which uh, arrangement of, of protons you have on a, in, in each structure. So I put the, later, uh, the letters in lowercase just so you don't confuse the A's and the B types of isomers with the, these isomer structures, which is entirely different, okay? And of course, these are the two leading structures. And now we move on to the electron transfer itself. So when you reduce this structure by one electron, we know that uh, the electron is gonna go to the molybdenum sites. And one of the things that you can do is to perform NMR. Uh, we know that NMR, um, the, the width of the peaks is uh, inversely proportional to the rate of electron exchange. Right. And furthermore, we know that, for instance, if you have a Kagan type structure with just one molybdenum atom, all we're going to get is intermolecular electron exchange. Right. So if we assume that the intermolecular electron exchange is going to be the same as in these systems right here, then we can somehow devise a way to extract both an intermolecular electron exchange rate and an intramolecular electron exchange rate, right? Intramolecular in the sense that the electron is hopping between each of the two molybdenums uh, in this structure right here, okay? And with these values here, we're supposed to somehow try to explain what is going on in the reduced structure and that is what I propose to do. So now in the reduced structure, there are four hydrogens. And uh, I did also a, a survey uh, to, just to see where to put them. And these are the leading candidates right here. So I'm not going to talk about the 2C isomer because it's too high in energy. These energies are in kilojoules per mole. And these three right here are the most abundant isomers, and they're the ones that I'm going to be talking about. How 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 does electron, how does the electron that is located in 
either one of these two molybdenum atoms, how does the electron hop from one center to the other? So first of all, let's look, let's look at the electronic structure of each of the, of the isomers. So this is, um, again, this is the reduced structure, uh, the H4, and there's one electron populating the metal orbitals. So in this case here, the electron is on the left side, on the left-hand side, and there is a LUMO, which is shortly above this, this uh, orbital right here. And this LUMO is predominantly a metal orbital on the right-hand side. For 2D, it's the exactly, exactly the opposite. So you have the electron on the right-hand side and a virtual LUMO orbital um, where the electron should reside on the left-hand side. So the electrons are localized in these structures, which is very interesting. So what, what is happening in, these, in, these, uh, in this instance? So it, it, you should, in principle, have a linear combination. If the molybdenums are equal, and uh, you can say that approximately they are, I mean, if, if, they're, if they're two molybdenum six sites, they, they should be equal and there should be a linear combination of atomic orbitals generating uh, a bonding and an anti-bonding combination of each of these two. But you can have uh, a symmetry breaking and you can just perform linear combinations of these two molecular orbitals right here and end up with a, a different set. Furthermore, if these distances somehow move further apart or, and this distance moves uh, closer, you end up with uh, a more stable interaction uh, as a result. And this is technically known as a pseudo Yantella distortion or second order Yantella distortion. Um, why the pseudo? Because in principle, these orbitals are not degenerate. So a Yantella distortion in principle applies to um, orbitals that are strictly speaking degenerate and these are not strictly degenerate but they're almost degenerate okay and uh basically this this accounts for the electron localization in the structure so there is a distortion of the oxygen atom the bridging oxygen atom uh, that moves closer to one of the molybdenum atoms and you can identify you identify where the electron is residing by looking at the crystals or rather the structure itself, because there's no crystal structure, you, you identify it by the longest um, bridging molybdenum oxygen bond, okay? The, and then you know that the electron is residing there. So um, this is just uh, uh, some another type of theoretical classification where you get um, mixing of oxidation states and, and you know, what what is exactly is that you have in, in this situation. Uh, you can assume that this is a class two type of um, compound because uh, these are the possible cases where you can, um, you can have valence or intervalence type of transfer. And you can see that class two is one that carries a transition state where you move from one oxidation state to the next, okay? So I don't want to be too technical about this, so let's move on. So for, for the two, this is the, the, um, the 2D isomer. I'm going to start with that. Okay, so this is where the electron is residing on the right-hand side. And it now moves to the left-hand side. And the energy goes up. So it's, it's an endergonic process. And there is a transition state in between these two and it's 12.8 kilojoules per mole. Now obviously these um, curves are not symmetric uh, per se uh, because uh, there are different conformational subtleties and, and um, strictly speaking the molybdenums are not really identical. With this one there is a, a surprising feature because um, you previously have 
you previously had in the D isomer, you had uh, two hydroxyl groups, and now you have one aqua group and one strictly oxyl group, okay? And with the two B isomer, the, go the curve simply goes up. There is nothing there on the other end. So this can be accounted by the, uh, what is called the, the metal oxo type of interactions um, that somehow destabilize the, the metal orbital that goes way up and simply the electron does not want to go to this structure right here, okay? With the 2A isomer, uh, what you have is uh, an aqua group here and an hydroxyl group there. So the lowest energy structure is this one where the electron is on the left-hand side and then it moves over to the right-hand side with a very, very subtle transition state right here, okay? And this is the summary of, uh, of all the curves that, um, um, that I'm presenting here. So now uh, I'm, I want to give you the, the, um, the, the, so, the SOMOs or the singly highest occupied molecular orbitals of each of the steps. And then you realize what, what is happening now. So you have an electron residing on the left-hand side. Here's the transition state and there is the product. Now, uh, I've signaled this with a little star just to say that it's an isomer and that, um, and that the, the energy is slightly higher, okay? Uh, for the 2D family, you have exactly the same. So the electron is on the right-hand side, there's a transition state, and now the electron is on the left-hand side. And this is a video of the... Um, the transition state vibrational coordinate, just so you can get an idea of, of what's happening. Obviously, there is um, a leading contribution from the oxygen in the bridging group. And this is the, the, um, the key, the key to, to the electron transfer, okay? This is what's mediating the, the electron transfer itself. Now, there is a slight contribution from the hydrogens uh, in the hydrogen bonding network over here. But um, I did some tests and they show that there is no signs of proton coupled electron transfer, okay? So this is um, widely known in the literature. My, uh, there are plenty of experimentalists who label proton coupling uh, of electron transfer erroneously because I think if, if there is a, um, the, ele the electron has to be coupled to the hydrogen atom transfer. And in this case, these two factors are completely independent. So if you, you can transfer one hydrogen and you can transfer one electron, and these instances are completely independent and you have uh, uh, an array of possibilities that you, can, that you can generate from there, okay? So now, uh, we know that we're in the presence of a class two type of um, electron transfer uh, isomer. So basically we know that this is how you explain the phenomenon. So you have one molybdenum five that somehow is giving away its electron to the other uh, molybdenum. And now molybdenum five becomes molybdenum six and molybdenum five uh, on the right hand side uh, is now the, the prevalent structure, okay? So, and these are the complementary, in the excited state, these are the complementary uh, states uh, that you get. And there is um, an interesting equation that measures these electron transfer processes. And this is the Marcus, the Marcus Hush rate equation. And you can access theoretically uh, all of these parameters because if you perform a time-dependent density functional uh, calculation on each of these steps, the, uh, the both reactants and the transition state, then you have access to the kinetics, the, the whole process, and, and you can calculate uh, a rate constant. So this, this is what I did, okay? So um, using the PBE zero functional, I uh, obviously I'm since the dependence is logarithmic, 
Um, obviously, there, there's never going to be um, a true quantitative agreement uh, between you know the 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 calculated uh, uh, rate constants and the experimental one. So this is the order of magnitude of the experimentally determined uh, rate constant. And these are the rate constants that I came up with. So there are several orders of magnitude in difference. So it would be perhaps too much to expect to have a, um, a quantitative agreement uh, in this case. But I, um, but obviously other parameters like uh, infrared uh, frequency vibrations and, and um, uh, G parameters, um, other types of parameters are calculated experimentally, uh, measured experimentally also uh, can also be reproduced by, uh, by the DFT calculations. Since I'm a little bit stubborn about these things, I uh, decided to maybe uh, move a little bit step, uh, a little bit uh, closer to a, a quantitative calculation. So I performed um, a single point couple cluster calculation on all of my determined structures and see what somehow the, how the rate constants would change with, with these recalculated values. So I use the same excited state parameters as I computed with TTDFT and all I all I recomputed was simply the, the ground state potential energies of uh, each of these um, each of these structures right here. So if you move a step closer towards quantitative agreement, then obviously, yeah, this is much closer to experiment than um, these previous calculations right here. So these, these values, by the way, were, were not published in, in the original paper. This is uh, something I did afterwards. So, but the, the computational resources were very, very extensive. And you know, fortunately I was able to, you know, um, to do this. So to summarize the conclusions are thus. So I, uh, we can see that there are two predominant uh, isomers in, um, the mono-reduced um, polyoxymethylate, mixed metal polyoxymethylate, and that the electron is localized um, in one of the molybdenum moieties uh, due to uh, pseudo Yantella distortion, and uh, proton coupled electron transfer has not been found um, um, in the uh, in the in the mono-reduced um, mono uh, polyoxymethylates. Um, these are independent features and uh, electron hopping occurs between metal sites bearing terminal hydroxyl or aqua ligands but not between aqua and oxaligands and I think this is a, an important feature um, which um, is evident from these uh, from these results and now the rate constant has also been calculated for the intramolecular electron hopping and uh, the magnitude now fairly uh, matches the experimentally measured one, okay? So uh, this is just uh, a snapshot of, of the computational details uh, in case you're interested. And my thanks go to my, um, my co-authors. So this is Hui Tsang. Uh, a picture of him now. He's now a CEO of Easy Sword, as I said. So he's, he's pretty much a millionaire. Uh, it's a miracle that he actually remembered anything of what he did uh, so long ago. But um, but there you have it. So um, I I also like to thank the the funding um, for for this research, uh, especially seen as it's it's been you know it's been done so long ago. So it's now two decades since uh, since this was uh, this was done experimentally, and uh, I'd like to thank you for 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 the attention and, and the patience in in listening to me. So over to you, Carlos. Thank you, Bruno. Great, very nice results and clearly presented. It's nice to see how. Uh, luckily, not very often. Huh? Uh, the projects uh, take so long. 
but it's also nice yeah to see that uh, yeah, after after yes also we have better tools now yeah maybe to to solve this problem yeah. and and we you know, that could couldn't be solved 20 years ago that is true yes well these things could not i mean surely this approach would never have been possible um, 20 years ago so so yes um that is that is something that um that should be yeah that is something you should be considered but um i i i don't know i just i this was just when i was in between postdocs that i became aware of this and i did some calculations and and then this stopped and you know lots of things happened and you know many things that when you when you're working on lots of things and obviously there are things that are left unfinished and then you come back to them maybe you have a different a different uh, perspective yeah so nice uh i have some questions but i let uh, the opportunity to others to ask first so any any question comment to no no switch uh, your mic on and go on Don't be shy. Well, 16 people at the very end, huh? and so 14 shy, no, no, and I, and plus 14 shy. So, okay, okay I, will, I go on with the first question. Uh, I love those TS uh, structures, the slide 18. Okay. Yeah, and and the discussion here about uh, the proton couplet with the electron transfer, yeah, because yeah, it, it really looks like the, that the proton want to move. No. Yes, but um, so did, but did, 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 could you find a, any transition state transition state corresponding to the proton transfer? I, I, I guess you look at for that. Yeah, I tried, but I couldn't. I couldn't find it because, uh, in fact, when you perform um, optimizations on all the possibilities, so proton on the left and proton on the right, and electron on the left, electron on the right, you can find both four possibilities are possible. You see, uh -huh. so my idea is that a proton coupled electron transfer would somehow be. Uh, more like um, it would have to be a, a concerted type mechanism, right? And this doesn't the, this doesn't happen because the proton stays there when you move the electron. Yeah, but you, you, you know you know that a proton, if there is any uh, water any any water molecule, additional water molecule, proton transfers uh, largely improve. Yeah, maybe here. You couldn't find the proton, how the proton moved because it's, the distance between the two oxygens is too long. Yes. And, a, and maybe a water molecule there could help. You know, we always can help a water molecule. Yeah? In any case, very, yeah, quite a, quite a complex situation. Yeah. Really quite a complex yeah. situation with a mixed balance the states. Yeah, and we know eh, that this is uh, tricky to handle. So, but you were very lucky here in this case, you know, because your orbitals were so localized. Yeah, yeah. And that, that surprised me because I was expecting, well, I, I wasn't surprised because obviously there was, there were experimental measurements that somehow if, if the electron were delocalized, I think it would show up on the NMR. Hmm. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, it, it's my idea initially was that somehow it had to do with with the number of protons on each on each terminal oxo. But um, but if you use the bare structure, just the you know structure with no protons, uh, you get also a localization of the electron. Uh -huh. So. Um, it would be nice to see how how this happens with 
say the number of of different addenda atoms on each of on each of the um, of the Kagan uh, of the Kagan type structures. So with two molybdenums, with three molybdenums, and so forth, it would be an interesting study to you know maybe try to look at that. Mm -hmm. It because would be nice to to, to 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 find a way to manipulate externally. Yeah, yeah. The states. And um, but um, but yeah. So it's and we know that what, another surprising feature is that the, if there's an oxo group, the the electron simply does not want to go there. If there's something easier, uh, if there's um, a hydroxyl group or something that facilitates the uh, the presence of the electron. This is something that, that was also very interesting. So quite often when we model polyosometallates, we just assume that the protons aren't there for convenience. But sometimes it, it may change may change the, the the electronic character of the structure if you're talking about reduced Yep. Muy bien. Any other question or comment? Nathan, did you understand everything? Yes, actually, I have to say it was uh, was very very clearly presented, and it's it's really nice to um, to see the way that you analyze and, and describe the electron transfer in palms. As compared with with the metal oxides, which is let's say somewhat of the solid state counterpart of of these kinds of systems, and also the importance here of of the hydrogens, which is something that in our system we typically haven't haven't investigated. Um, I actually did have a, a a couple of questions or or remarks. So. Firstly, when on the slide where you're showing the Marcus T, I really like this slide. It's it's really nicely presented, and it I think it summarizes Marcus theory very very compactly. Is exactly this one. So, yeah. what would you say is then the um, the inciting incident that, that that drives the electron transfer here? Would this be some kind of of um, would it be some kind of photoelectric effect or would it be a vibrational excitation that, that drives the electron transfer here? Um, I think there should be, I think there should be what is usually known in the literature as vibronic coupling. And that should probably be uh, of assistance in, in, this, in, in this system right here. Um, yeah, but you can only again you can only approximate what is what is going on right here. So these uh, these are very generic curves um, for metals that are the same. Um, yeah. But um, but yeah, so, a kind of symmetry baked into it. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, I find it very interesting because typically in our system where we also have electron localization in serum oxide, mm, typically we, we model them as, as being vibrationally excited using, using, um, using in this case, polarons to kind of measure this, which is very much a salt state kind of concept. But, um, but here you can more clearly separate electronic effects from the vibrational ones, I think. So using yeah. this kind of scheme. So I was just kind of curious if, if with this you could also kind of measure which one is, is more determinant. But but I see very much that both of them are, are coupled, yes. Yes, uh, I mean, there are models for vibronic coupling, but I I didn't want to go too far into that, into those theories because, uh, I don't know, I think that what you have to gain is not so much um, with uh, with respect to the effort that you put in, so um, 
it doesn't couple directly to the experiments let's yeah see. and then again you're never going to have quantitative agreement you just have mm -hmm. an estimate or an idea of what is what is actually taking place yes as you showed actually with using couple cluster then for the ground state already does much more actually to, to get the reaction rates so i agree that it was just let's say a theoretical curiosity mm -hmm. um then I was also kind of wondering. So, so basically, if I if I understood it correctly, the um, the electron transfer barrier in the the two way uh, system is lower in barrier than than in the two D, right? So I was kind of wondering is if if you could actually facilitate a proton transfer, would this then make both of them? equal is this what what is kind of breaking it or um let's say that that symmetry or or is it a different effect um so where you were showing i think it's slide 18 or, or something like that yes where you were showing basically both of the models so yeah the you mean these transition states right here yes exactly so because as far as I understood, uh, the 2A lies lower in energy than, than the 2D, right? Yes. Um, this is, let me see. Mm -hmm. This Indeed. one right here, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so you... my, my idea by demonstrating this was somehow to try to get, um, uh, an idea of the ensemble of isomers that is present in, then again, there's always this assumption that what you have uh, isolated in the solid state is actually what you have the same as what you have in solution. Right? And it may not be the case. You may have more protons, less protons. Yeah. Uh, again, these are all assumptions, okay? So, but, um, but yes, um, bear in mind that these are kilojoules, so the difference is not all that much. But um, but yes, in, in this case, you have one aqua ligand right here on the left, and and on the right you have an equal distribution of hydroxyl ligands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so I, I guess you could say that that the proton is is the reason why you have this slight discrepancy in energy. Yes. Yes. And also, I think the protons can easily shift between each of the oxygens. So there can be a constant interconversion between the isomers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, you could in a, in a certain sense use in, because they're, they're, they're not coupled, but you could, could in a sense kind of, if, if you, exactly. like you were discussing before with, with Carlos, if you then yeah. integrate additional molybdenums, you could kind of almost push them around, control, yeah. control how they move. That, that's very nice. That's very interesting. Protons can move very fast, so it's just mm -hmm. it's very interesting. Thank you. That Thank was you. that was very enlightening. Anyone else? Everyone's bored. Maybe they're just coming up still with, with questions, or, or maybe it's so clear. Oh. Enrique, did you understand everything? Yeah, yeah, I, I did, I did. But I mean, I'm not also uh, I, uh, a big uh, expert uh, of mm, electron transfers. I did something about that, but not much. So I just enjoyed the talk and. We did our. Uh, you know the the uranium project. Well, yeah, but there was more like yeah photochemistry, but but you know I mean it was it was kind of clear. I I really like it. I do not have much questions in that sense, but but yeah, and also I made a look of on the paper that you published, so so I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, okay, so if there is no other common question, I think that we have to thank again Nuno for accepting our invitation and also 
I want to thank uh, all attendants for coming to this open seminar. Yeah. Uh, just let you know that next week we'll have a second session. And in this uh, second session, the announcement is just ready and probably will be distributed in the next minutes because I just saw the official uh, announcement uh, about the talk that uh, Dolores Melgar will give us uh, next week. Yeah. Uh, Dolores now is uh, an important, say, uh, piece in the research landscape in Ireland. And uh, he's, uh, let's say, uh, uh, pushing up in the ladder of responsibilities uh, in uh, that kind of uh, job. And uh, I think it will be very, very interesting to listen to her uh, next Monday uh, about. Uh, her new job and uh, the opportunities, the richest opportunities in that country. Yeah. And uh, with that, uh, we close this session today. Uh, so thanks uh, everyone again for coming. We hope to see you next Monday. <laughs>